Evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depends where you are. And uh, my name is Usama Salama. I'm the CEO of Human Health Education and Research Foundation. Uh, I want to thank every one of you who is attending the call today, as well as to thank our uh, main guest, James Kuzak, for being with us today. And uh, for you to get a quick understanding about what we are trying to achieve in HHERF. We are a group of people, a group of experts who witnessed the failure during the pandemic and felt the need for coming together, felt the need that we can make a difference if we work together and end silos. And we have decided to do this through a multi-sectoral cross-border approach. In other words, we are building a community. We are bringing the people together to empower generations, to create resilience and build a healthier future. Our main goal is to find the way to end up the universal health coverage issue. And we could only achieve this if we work together. But today I am urging every one of us to interact and ask questions during the presentation of James. If you have any question, please put it on the chat. And once we finish with our uh, uh, discussion, there will be a space for questions. And I hope that this uh, could be a good interaction and learning for all of us. As we have just mentioned, the webinar is recorded and we will definitely make this recording available for everybody. As of now, please allow me to start and uh, um, I would welcome James and thank you with, to be with us today, James. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to uh, talking today. James, uh, let me start with a simple question, but I want as well our audience to understand who are you? What's your background? How did you get involved with Utestica? And this would give us a good understanding. So we start the rest of our questions, but the audience as well, to know who is James on the personal level. Perfect. Well, I'm uh, really, uh, really happy to do that. So um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm James Cusack. I'm the chief executive of Autistica, which is a UK-based autism research charity. Now, before I joined Autistica, I was an academic. So I did a PhD and a, and a, a postdoc fellowship at the University of Aberdeen, which is in Scotland. And um, prior to that, I was, uh, and during that really, I was involved in conversations around policy and autism policy in Scotland. So I was uh, part of a, a core group of people who were responsible for bringing forward Scotland's first ever autism strategy. And I've worked in a range of roles directly with um, autistic people. Um, autistic people myself and um, in, in, in places like schools and healthcare settings and so on. Um, the reason I became interested in autism was because um, as a child I was diagnosed as, as, as being autistic and I was recognized quite early on as being as being quite different. And the reason that um, I'm really passionate about the work that we do is because we know that um, autistic people face real and substantial um, inequalities and we're really committed to ensuring that that changes. Um, that, that's very interesting, James. But in order also to get at the essence, because many of our participants on this webinar, as you know, are not based in UK. Mm -hmm. And some of us do understand what is autism, some they don't. And maybe the understanding that we have about autism is different. Mm -hmm. We want to listen to you. If you could explain it, what is autism? And on the other side, how prevalent it is. Sure. So um, everyone described autism differently. And it's, it, of course, it's always described differently at uh, different cultural contexts. But in the UK, we describe autism as a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition. And so the word neurodevelopmental means uh, it's something that occurs in the brain and changes throughout your lifespan and so life in many ways and being a human being is a developmental condition and we all we all change who we are um, as we develop through life and our brains change as well and the same is true if you're autistic 
in some like chat. It's, it's a condition which affects how you develop as a human being. Um, so um, the, the key thing to know is that every autistic person is different and some people are able to um, live and learn and work independently while others might need quite specialist support. We reckon there's around one in 67 people are autistic and the characteristics of autism are around having difficulty, differences, difficulties with social communication and interaction. Some autistic people can find it difficult to interpret language or understand or recognize the feelings of others. Autistic people might have quite specific sensory sensitivities, so it can be under or over sensitive to um, sensory inputs, so for example, sounds or smells or lighting. Um, and then autistic people can have quite specific routines or repetitive behaviours and interests. And so um, we know that autistic people can find the world uncertain and routines can be comforting for autistic people. And the autistic, we know that autistic people may participate in behaviours to calm themselves uh, or have highly specific interests um, um, as well, which can be important, but also they need to be um, managed um managed effectively as well in the uk and, and globally we know that autistic people many and that many autistic people do and can live fulfilling lives but we also know that autistic people globally are routinely denied support or subject to harmful attitudes places are spaces are inaccessible we know that there's serious health inequalities that lead to a reduced life expectancy we know that by mid childhood around half of autistic children meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder and that leads to um, unnecessary um, admissions to things like inpatient mental health care and we also know certainly in the UK that autistic people are both underemployed so they if they get a job it doesn't reflect their skills or unemployed uh, they're more likely to be unemployed and um, um, according from the 2020 um, Office of National Statistics figures, we found that in the UK, 21.7% of autistic people are in employment, and that compares to 80% in the general population, or 50% um, of disabled people. That's this is this is very interesting, James. James, if you allow me to say this, and I think I got your consent before this, for our audience to understand, James is having autistic as well, he's autistic. But I personally was surprised from the first day we started talking to each other. Um, and this is telling everybody of us, we're gonna put a poll question to ask the audience today, if any of you are having um, someone who is autistic, dealing with an autistic person, this is very important as well for us to understand. James is the CEO of UK largest autistic, autism research organization, if I'm not mistaken, James, right? And the gentleman has been leading the organization successfully doing all what it takes to change the attitude and to make sure that the people understand what is autism and understand what could we do in, in an appropriate way. James, allow me to ask you one important question for me. If, if, if you are today in charge of the um, policy making, what would be your number one decision to make this more understandable to people? If you wanna put a rule, a law about autism, what would be number one rule that you will put in front of the decision making and asking them that this is something that we need to legalize? Yeah, it's a really, really interesting question. And I, I, I think the question depends on the context. So, you know, I think globally, the UK is in a very, very good position. I think um, in terms of society's understanding of autism, although there's a huge amount to do there and we're, through World Autism, it's World Autism Acceptance Month in April, and we're doing an awful lot of work on that. Um, so I think building an understanding of autism, I think globally is um, is 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 e e e extremely key. It has to be a, a policy of priority. I mean, we interestingly we were asked this question yesterday. So I'm part of the England's um, at the moment autism strategy executive group. We were sort of asked if you were to choose one policy priority, what would it be? 
And um, for me, the key thing is making sure that people get from the moment of diagnosis the right um, the right support. And so a personalized a personalized understanding of what their diagnosis means and then a proper support plan in, in place. Um, at the moment, quite often what happens, and this is quite something that seems to happen globally, is that people fight very hard to get a diagnosis. And then when they get a diagnosis, people are often disappointed because support doesn't doesn't follow. And um that's that's a that's certainly a huge problem in the UK and, and, and beyond is for me, I think making sure that people understand because autism is quite a broad term, understand specifically what the diagnosis means for them, and then understanding how um how you know how, how we can provide a package of support and having making sure that each nation has a, a, a plan in place for that for me is, is something that's really key. And we've, we've produced a plan called the Autistica Support Plan, which um, helps to um, outline some of that. Um, James, is this Autistica Support Plan, is it open public resource on the website? It certainly is, it certainly is. So I can, i um, very, very happy for people to do that. So they just Google, Autistic a support plan, they'll be able to find it. Um, okay. They'll be able to find it there. And in fact, um, I have just put it in the chat. There you That's go. awesome. Just for your knowledge, I this is as per my knowledge, I know at least two mothers among the participants who have autistic kids. And uh, we try as much as possible to be working and living as a community and supporting each other. Yeah. Um, that, that brings us, and what you've mentioned, James, now, to an important bit, piece, which is the myths and the misconceptions mm -hmm. about it. But if you could be fortunate and kind to tell us what are the major myths and misconceptions about autism that you personally faced as a child, as an adolescent, and you're facing now as being the CEO of Autistic. So, I mean, I think one of the things that we, um, I think a really key overarching thing that we've been really trying, we've been really working hard to focus on is helping people to understand that autism is, is not, a, not the same thing for everyone and that everyone has a different experience and every autistic person has, has different has different needs and experiences and so on. We recently did some work with a, a polling company, so a company that polls the general population just to understand what sort of attitudes and people were experiencing. And there's still issues around thinking that autism is something where, which means that you can't empathize with people at all, you don't understand people. Um, still issues with people seeing autism as something that, 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 that that, that simply has to be cured or that we should be searching for a cure for. And that's not an attitude that we hold at, at, at Autistica. We think that it's about supporting people with their individual needs and understanding the, the breadth of attitudes that exist. And, you know, personally, you know, I've had people say a number of unkind things to me, people being surprised that I can do things like drive a car, that I can live on my own, that I'm married, that I have kids. People said, almost questioning whether or not it's right that I have kids, you know, people, um, you know, suggesting, you know, that you, you don't care about other people because you're autistic. Um, you know, people like teachers trying to make jokes about it in front of everyone, um, ask, being asked if I think autism really exists, um, you know, being that having people suggest that I wouldn't be able to do the job that I'm doing because I'm autistic, you know, people thinking that I'm, <laughs> quite often I have people thinking that I'm good at things because I'm autistic and I'm not as, <laughs> they can be quite disappointed sometimes <laughs> because I'm like, you know, some might think I've got really good attention to detail and, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily do. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, so, you know, I've experienced a range of things, you know, personally, but we also know, and again, if you go to our website, you'll see some very recent polling, which outlines, you know, some of the current attitudes that we know exist within the UK, although they're very UK specific, I should add. Yeah. Thank you, James. Uh, you know, James, you're touching my heart when you're saying some kind of these things. 
But, but this brings me to the point, have you find it very challenging to educate the community and the people about the visit? Is it? So, I mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, we know that autism and, you know, looking at neurodiversity, so this idea that everyone has different brains, you know, in terms of building that understanding in the general public, we know that we're at the foothills, right? So this is very, very early days and, and societies and um, understand this at different, at different times, at different points in their history. And I think, you know, we've got some, We've got a huge amount of work to do to build that and but what i think that you know a lot of the initiatives that we're doing making sure that we've got autistic people and you know where autistic people can represent themselves family members advocating and explaining the different ranges of um of experiences um that exist i think that's really really i think that's really really powerful and important i think it's important that we have a breadth of experience as representatives of people from different backgrounds who have different stories and not just either people who have quite high support needs or they are the more outstanding you know, examples in society we need we need all of the stories to come through the test of people's lives and when we do that we'll we'll begin to build an understanding of what what is yes. what it's like to be autistic and how actually the autistic people are just part, part of society like everyone like everyone else you know, that, that was almost my next question to you. Mm -hmm. What do you think we should do more to educate the people? Because I, I personally see this sometimes in public. When I see a, a kid who is autistic doing something and the people around don't have the understanding and the knowledge and they don't know that he is autistic, but they are not happy with his attitude. So I don't know, James, what do you think? What can we do further? How can we really, as a people, as a community, how could we improve this kind of understanding for, from the society to the autistic people? I think, I think it's, I think it's about, um, you know, I think, I think it's about trying, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, it's about trying to tell people stories, trying to build empathy and understanding, I think is really, really important, you know, so it's this, um idea you know so you know we <laughs> that thing where parents get judged for the children's behavior you know i'm a parent of, of a four-year-old and an eight-year-old and i've had a couple of occasions where my, neither of my children are, are autistic but they've behaved in ways that were unexpected and um i've seen the judgment that comes with that <laughs> and, and you know it does make me empathize and understand um you know some of the experience that parents and uh, and you know my parents might, might have had to go through as well and you know i think it's about supporting people to be able to advocate and tell their stories but making sure that nationally governments and organizations are working strategically to get those messages out there working with media and 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 so on to make sure that the general public are, are builds more and more of an understanding of this but also i think being realistic you know, as well, I think one of the mistakes is is is, is that people think um, that we can get the whole of society to understand everything about autism. We're not going to be able to do that either. But if we can help society to understand some basic things about what it's like to be autistic and, and to understand autism and to understand the family context, um, that would be a huge step forward. That's 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 very uh, very much needed, uh, James. Mm -hmm. And I think you have been as autistica, you've been doing a lot of efforts. But this brings us to the point of the adoption from the society. Have you felt this, that we are really making a change? Are we really moving in the right direction? Is the velocity of the development and the evolution is in the right track? Or do you think that we, we really need some kind of radical change? Progress is progress is is a messy business, and making progress is, is 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 tricky. And it's always tempting to feel like we're not getting anywhere. You know, I've been involved in autism for twenty years. And my my view is that we we are we are making steps forward. Is the progress happening at the pace that we would like it to happen? Probably, probably not. You know, should you know, could we? You know, you know, through research and things like that, 
be doing a better job of making sure that we're reflecting people's priorities. Yes, you know, could governments do a better job of prioritizing autism? I think so. I think society does um, a poor job of under, you know, I, I think of the inequalities that autistic people experience happened in any other group. They wouldn't be tolerated in quite the same way that they are. So we need to get rid of just also the indifference towards aut autistic people. I think that would go a long way. But what I do know is that certainly, and obviously I'm from the UK, and so that's where my expertise lies. But I, I what I do know is that with a build, with a creation of an understanding, with 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 with, with, with some plans in place, things can improve. We can get better diagnosis. Diagnosis has improved in the UK. In, in the UK, we can people's understanding and awareness of autism has improved greatly. Um, so we're still at the foothills. There's still a huge amount to do to address the sort of injustices and inequalities that statistic people face. But um, we've, we have made, that, that's, that, that doesn't mean that we haven't made progress. I think we have made some important fully, progress. Fully agree, James. Fully agree. James, in the beginning, you uh, mentioned neurodiversity, but uh, allow me to take you back to this and if you could elaborate for the audience that is participating today, and for those even who will watch the webinar later, what is neurodiversity? What does it really mean? And why it is important for us to discuss at the society level? Yeah, it's a really good question. So people get a little bit confused about this. People sometimes think that when you talk about neurodiversity, you're talking about just different neurodevelopmental conditions. So they think you're talking about autism or ADHD um, or different conditions like that. Neurodiversity is the idea that we all, all human beings, we all have different brains. We all think about, perceive and understand the world in a different way. And the idea and one of the great things about neurodiversity is that it doesn't just talk about people with neurodevelopment conditions, it talks about all of us. And I think we all, as individuals and, and societies, since the pandemic have, has begun, have had to think about the things that we need to do, things that we used to take for granted. So that how we work, how we look after our kids, how we do some of the things that we do for enjoyment, like leisure activities and, 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 and so on. And um, what we try to encourage at, at Autistica, uh, and we encourage other workplaces to do this, and we hopefully do this within our own workplace, is, is, is to try and encourage everyone to think about who they are and how that, what that means relative to other people. And I think it's a very, very powerful and important paradigm, not just for thinking about autism or neurodevelopmental conditions, but for us all building an awareness that we, yeah. all, we are all different and we all think about and perceive the world differently. Because, because we've been born with different brains. Thank you, James. Thank you very much for sharing this. James, uh, if you allow me to ask, how did you hear and know about Autistica? Um, so I was an autism researcher, so I was doing a PhD, and um, I got invited to be, um, I, I, so I became aware of them, I got invited to be on a member of their um, scientific review panel so i was helping them out and i became increasingly excited about the work and the potential of the of the organization oh and and that was your passion because i see you've been a phd researcher on autism i think this was the reason that you joined and you started to be more passionate about it and you wanted to 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 help as well right yeah yeah that's right and you know from my perspective you know the reason I'm really passionate about the work that Autistica does is because I believe that, um, well, we need change in understanding society. If we don't know what works for autistic people, if we don't know how to provide the right support, how to assess what people's needs are, how to ensure that we get autistic people into work, you know, improve attitudes to autism, um, make sure that we have approaches that work for issues like anxiety, address health problems, um, 
and make space for the sort of the environments that autistic people navigate more accessible. If we don't have an evidence base underpinning that, that shows that we can actually improve things for autistic people in, in areas like this, then, then we're not going to make progress. We're not going to make progress. We need to proceed with certainty and an understanding of what works and what doesn't work for different types of autistic people. And so one of the things that that I'm really passionate about us doing autistic is helping to build that evidence base and then ensure that when that evidence base is built, it doesn't just exist in journals or papers, but it yeah. actually is used and, and, and actually translated into the real world. So a lot of what we do is not just about supporting and funding research, but taking what we currently know and making sure that it's applied into the real world so it make, actually makes a real difference for people. That's, that's very impressive, James. James, for, for us to understand Otestica more, what are the main focus areas of Otestica as an organization? So in terms of what we do, we fund and shape research, we and try to influence and work with policymakers, and then we try to share the latest evidence-based information with um, a range of different people, including the public and, or people who are um, autistic or, are fam or family members. Um, we have six goals which we're currently working towards which are called um, they're called 2030 goals and they're around the change that we'd like to see in society um, by 2030 and i just alluded to some of them now but just just to be clear we want to ensure that every autistic person gets the right support from day one by 2030 that we double the rates of employment for autistic people so that we know that in the uk it's 20 it was in, in 2021 it was 21.7 percent and we want to see that double and um, by 2030 we think that's realistic and um, we want to ensure that um we have evidence-based treatments for anxiety because we know that this is a huge issue for autistic people um, and highly prevalent by mid um Mid, 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 mid childhood. Um, we want, um, we, we have worked very hard with the government to emphasize the health and life expectancy inequalities that autistic people face. And so we want all autistic people to have an annual health check by 2030. Um, and we're funding research to get that done. Um, we want public spaces to be more accessible for autistic people and to know what that means and to have evidence to know what works. And then also we want attitudes um, our final goal is by 2030, we want attitudes to autism to positively change. Um, and so we're, at the moment, we're, um, we're creating an index which will measure the public's attitude, public's attitude to autism. And we're going to poll the public on a regular basis, but we're also going to test different approaches, which um, we hope will help to change the public's attitudes um, to autism with a view to uh, people having a much more understanding and accepting approach to autism. Interesting. James, uh, is there any space for the public or the audience to participate in these projects that you are doing? Mm -hmm. Are you open for the community to be engaged? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have, we've, you can, um, if you sign up online, you can find out much more information about the work that we're doing and opportunities to get involved. Um, we, um, there's loads of different ways in which people can support our work. Um, both by contributing or participating in it, or um, you know, we're 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 a charity, so we have to fundraise all the money that we have. So if anyone can help us with that, it's always appreciated. <laughs> um, you know, we, um, you know, so so there's lots of different ways in which people can get involved. So we have companies who we have corporate partners, different trusts and foundations, uh, private supporters who support what we do, and we have and. Most importantly, of many autistic people and families who are working with us, and they, you know, a key part of what Autistica does is to ensure that research, um, all the research that we do, is not just guided by scientists, but guided through people who have lived the experience and can help guide and inform the work that we're doing. That's that's interesting, James. The 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 part that you mentioned earlier when you mentioned about your work and the focus areas that you are working also on the policy making and the policy shaping. And um, could you be kind to share with us how are you helping to influence and shape the public policies when it comes to living with autism? So, first of all, we have a dedicated policy function. So we have resource in place to deal with this. So we have um, people who work with um, 
are government bodies in the UK, so civil servants, um, so people who work for the government. Um, and uh, we work directly with politicians to help brief them and help them to understand the issues that are most important to autistic people. And one of the key ways in which we try to influence policy is by not just talking about the fact that a problem exists, but by sharing what we believe are realistic solutions that can be implemented for um, autistic people. So we, you know, we, we, when we, when we work with government, we hopefully put in fully costed ideas that we think can really help to improve things for autistic people, but we think will be things the government will accept as as ideas. And so we, um, you know, we what we basically do is provide real innovative but realistic um, solutions which are informed by the latest evidence and um, the community's views so we in all of our briefings they're co-authored they're sort of co-authored or co-led by autistic people um, but also by the late by scientists and people with relevant expertise in the area and what we're hopefully doing is, is providing sort of a, a credible blueprints which can hopefully help the government to make a difference yes that's that's um that that makes me feel that we still need to do a lot from the community side as we we opened in the introduction and for those who joined us late we at human health education and research foundation are building an ecosystem we're bringing multi-sectoral minds together and James, my question to you here is, how can we educate the business leaders from the different sectors about autism? How can we really make sure that the industries are more inclusive, particularly for the people living with autism? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, if, if, if you're talking about this from an employer perspective or a company's perspective, um, we know a huge number of the population are autistic. So one in 67 is a lot now. We know that um, around 10% of the population meet criteria for a neurodevelopmental condition or what we would describe as neurodiversion. And so that's a sizable proportion of the population. We know that there's considerable competition now um, in the work, sort of in the marketplace to try and get the best talent and to get the best people. Yes, And we also know, it is just a fact guided by evidence, that having people who think differently and having diverse teams improves business performance. And so, that, you know, what, um, what these organisations need to understand is this is not a charitable activity for them. This, yes. is, um, this is the right thing for them to be doing. And, um, you know... I, I, the way that I would say work with businesses, if you don't make your organization an inclusive place to be that accommodates different ways of thinking, yes. you, you, are, you are negatively affecting your organization's and business's performance. And so I think there's a huge positive case to be made when it comes to autism, that if, if, if workplaces can be more inclusive, then, um, then, then they can succeed. And then, so I think that is helping them to understand that. And the second thing we need to do is we need to offer people solutions. So we need to be able to yes. give them practical things that they can do that's easy for them to implement that, um, that are achievable for organizations and companies. And so there's no point just saying organizations aren't inclusive, organizations aren't accepting if we don't then follow that up with, and here's how you, here's how you can do this and here's how you can support people in different ways workplaces and different companies and that's that's a big part of what we're focusing on as well as taking what we know and what we've heard from people and implementing it so it makes a difference i 100 percent agree fully agree you know james one of my challenges in this world is the word charity i hate the word charity because it doesn't make sense that we uh, speak about social responsibility it's we are human beings and these activities are social responsibility, which should be accountable, all of us, for this. And then we name it charity. Then the people are doing this as a gesture or are doing this as a support, which is nonsense. We've learned all from uh, COVID and from the pandemic that there are no borders when it comes to disease and health. 
We are not safe unless we are all safe. It's a one ecosystem, one small community, one small planet. And if we keep speaking the language of a charity, charitable, charity, charitable, we're not getting anywhere. We need to stop sensing the responsibility, the accountability as being human beings and working together. This, this takes me to the last question. Uh, and then James, we would move to the audience and, and listen to, to their comments, interaction and questions. Among all what you have done, since the beginning, James, whether research, whether work, whether initiatives, tell me what are you most proud of? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I think I'm, I'm involved in this because I want us, I want, you know, well, I'm an autistic person, but I'm also an autistic person who's grown up alongside other autistic people and so I when I think about this I think about all of the different lives I've grown up around and the experiences that people have gone on to have and one of the things that struck me most happened about two or three months into the job and I saw this research paper that came out which showed that there were substantial life expectancies and inequalities and it came out from Sweden from one of the they have, they have amazing registries and ways of tracking things. And this to me was like the smoking, the final piece. And if this was, they definitively showed that autistic people die earlier than the general population and have real health inequalities. And since then, we've really been able to raise awareness of this issue, get the government to recognize it in the UK. We've worked with researchers to understand how we address this. And we've created a health check that can be used by doctors to help assess the different health problems that autistic people have. And we're currently uh, trialing that. We've also got the NHS. The, we have a nationalised health service in the UK. Um, and so we've got the NHS to commit to rolling this out. So our health service in the UK to roll that out. And to me, that's like... Um, an incredible thing to think about, to think about all of the people across the UK that will have access to this, that will hopefully have some of their health needs identified and will hopefully um, make sure that we eliminate some of the health problems that autistic people experience and hopefully ultimately um, contribute to um, improving life expectancy for, for autistic people. And so that's an example of the sort of thing where I, which I feel really passionate about. It's about funding the research, looking at what the research is saying, and then making sure that it makes a big difference. And so that's, um, you know, that's, you know, I think that's a, an example of where I think we as a charity can play a big role because it's joining up the research, the policy, and making sure that that change is ultimately implemented that makes a difference. Thank you very much, James. That was, uh, for me, very informative. And um, my notes are very interesting. If you see my notes, it's a very interesting notes. What I have been doing is writing words from what you are saying, because I believe that these words are the key to our healthier future. But just to share with the audience some of the words that I wrote behind uh, 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 um, um, James and after listening to James, I wrote right support, proper support plan, and um, I wrote as well empathy, understanding, progress, plans in place, research, policy making, opportunity to contribute, employers, charity, I wrote it while not being happy, but I wrote it, solutions, practical, achievable, follow-up, equality, recognize it, understand it, rolling out, and last but not least is passionate. Um, I will stop here by the last word, which is passionate. And before going to the uh, questions, I would invite one of our team members, our PR director, 
Haley, who is online today. And I see that she wrote on the chat that she would like to share her own experience with her son. I will leave the floor to Haley. And then after Haley, we'll open the floor for everybody who would like to ask questions. Before I, I hand over to Haley, I would kindly ask everyone from the attendees to open your cameras if you want. Unless you don't want to open the camera, please feel free. But please open your cameras. It is the time that we come up together as a community, listen, interact, and ask questions. Thank you, James. And over to you, Haley. You need to unmute yourself. Now you can. Hi there. <clears throat> Greetings from Scotland as well, everyone. Um, James, I could listen to you talk all day um, and a lot of what you're saying, um, Asama as well, a lot of what you're saying is hitting home with me just now to share our experience as a family. We have two children and our eldest during lockdown started to suffer from quite severe anxiety. So when you're talking about the anxiety, James, that really hit home. And I know from personal research that anxiety and stress is a huge, huge depletion of our health and our well-being. So anything to do to reduce the stress and anxiety, I'm all for it. But as a result of that, we now see some OCD and some very frustrating and aggressive and self-harming behaviours. And we are going through the process of a neurodivergent assessment. We've been given some medication, an SSRI, um, some melatonin sleep medication, because I didn't realise that um, children with autism produce less melatonin and adults who have less problems sleeping, which makes sense why he's slept four hours for the last 10 years. So um, he's, he's finally getting the support. And he actually said to me on several occasions, I need help. I need help. And I think for a child at 10 to ask that, we knew he needed help, but we were shouting for help. And the process was so slow. The doctors were very, very, they were great, but they're very slow. They're just overwhelmed. Um, and I think what it's opened my eyes to, and with joining HERF as well, is that we do need to bring experts together to get what people need quicker and to help the next generation be a healthier society. Because if we keep going this way and not raising awareness, not um, you know giving children the help they need to grow into strong adults, I think we are going to be in quite a sorry state so I think you know it's been great to hear you speak we are on a we're on a long journey I feel like we're just at the the start of it um and I, I you know I just love your advice and I, I just feel so passionate that all the other families that are going through this whether it be children or adults or friends that they get the help and support they need because the way it was described to me is that everybody sees the world different but with autism you need it's a different playing field completely and we just need to balance that out so i'm hoping that the work that i can help with with her will help get your awareness out as well and, and well done for everything that you've done i think it's amazing with the nhs so well done thank you Haley. james any comments on Haley's uh, um, interaction just to say that um well thank you very much for, for sharing your experience and yeah i think they experiences that you have are you know very very common and I think everyone's um trying to to find a way to find a way through this and in particular the issues with anxiety that's something that we hear an awful lot about you know and a lot of parents and autistic people with children will say the issues with anxiety in the end almost supersede the being autistic in terms of what acts as a barrier in terms of people do, dealing with day-to-day -day activities and if you can help to get the anxiety under control and what drives the anxiety under control, um, quite often um, autistic um, people can live, can, can live a, um, a, a very good life. And that's what this is ultimately all about. And so, yeah, I, I, and also the, the issue around sleep that um, Haley mentioned is, is also a huge issue as well. We know that from a very early age and through out people, autistic people's lives. Many autistic people have real issues with sleep. So I hope the melatonin 
works um, works it well. And also, there's good. I just also, I think, I think, I, I can't remember. There was also a study in children or adults that showed that for many people, melatonin can be can be helpful as well. Thank you very much, James. Uh, James, uh, I will start with the questions that I have on the chat. I have so far one question on the chat, and then we'll open the floor to the audience if anyone would like to ask a question. We have a question uh, asking about tips that uh, uh, how can they handle the attitude from a child screaming, yelling, or banning his head, or refusing to move from the ground? How could we handle something like this? Yeah, I mean, I think in the moment it's very, very difficult, isn't it? I don't think there's many, there's many easy solutions. I think for the autistic child in person, I think having some sort of way that helps them to communicate that they're autistic, I think can be can be helpful if that's a, if that's something the person wants to do and that can also help provide independence for autistic people so i know that many autistic people have 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 cards and and are things like that that they bring around so they can help identify themselves and, ex and explain because quite often when autistic people are 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 stressed or angry or frustrated it's because they, f they find what's going on current uh, in a specific um a specific moment uh, over overwhelming so i think being able to communicate that is important i think you can have have individual conversations with people but the degree of empathy which you experience just depends an awful lot individually and, and i wouldn't i would hope like that we don't put parents in a position where they overly have to justify their child or themselves and because um, we should hopefully just be moving toward, towards a world where people are accepting, but unfortunately these experiences, unfortunately that isn't where we are right now and those experiences are very, very common. So I don't have, a, I don't have, I don't, I don't have any brilliant solutions. I think one of the things that we've, we funded some research around um, helping parents to deal with the stigma that they, they experience, and I think helping to build resilience in parents is important because um, they, they may well be unfairly judged and I think it's you know you know one of the things that I've I'm not I've not a period going through this but one of the things that I've experienced personally is is, is just you've got to kind of pick your battles <laughs> unfortunately and like you know you you, you can't pick if you, you can't pick every single battle and some some of the things sometimes you just have to you know so for your own mental health you just have to try your best to sort of take a deep breath and then move on <laughs> um but yeah it's very tricky because these attitudes unfortunately are you know some of the things which act as the biggest barrier to autistic people and their families now, thank you very much james and i hope uh, that this answers the questions to the audience if um, uh, if there is any continuation, I see that Mercedes wants to ask and continue to that question. Please, Mercedes, floor is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, with that. I think it's uh, very important that the child should be uh, diagnosed in early age, and then because it's a very broad question, and if there are diagnoses early as you know, uh, one month and there should be a proper assessment because if there's no proper assessment then it's very hard to everyone to handle that child because it depends on the on the, uh, the weight and the they're doing such because of the frustration that they could hardly express themselves but if you uh if they are like diagnosed in an early age then you should have um uh, like plenty of prompts and interventions mm -hmm. in order that at least uh, you can give some uh, you know activities to those children that are deficit in the social and emotional uh, reciprocity and uh, nonverbal communication that's what i Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. James, any comments? Yeah, no, I think it's, you know, one of the things that we do know is that 
help but early diagnosis appears to be important for the person to help them to understand themselves the family unit as well i think it's really important there's some research from one of our trustees jonathan green who did the, probably the best clinical trial in this area which shows that if you can educate parents in particular and help them to understand how they can adapt what they're doing to sort of on to meet the differences the, the, the different ways of thinking that ch the child has and, and supporting them through that, that actually makes a big difference, both in terms of parental, both in terms of the autistic child's outcomes, but also parent, parents' well being as well and sense of assuredness they have, because this is a, obviously a very huge thing for parents to have to, to experience and try to get their, their head around as well. Thank you, James. Uh, Catherine, you have your hands, and then we have Carl afters. Yeah, Jane, thank you for the presentation. That was really interesting. And um, I, I would like to, to know, because we, we talked before about um, organizations should um, become more open and also provide, obviously, uh, jobs for autistic people. But I think it would be helpful to start a lot earlier. And this, um, because also we know that children, for example, um, can be quite brutal and in order to um, support autistic children and protect them from any kind of bullying that they might experience at an early age is there a way or do you have any experience um, how this topic could be addressed in schools already mm -hmm. yeah, there so might be some awareness among the children but so also among the teachers we're funding some research, we're, we're sort of co-funding some research at the moment in Edinburgh, which looks at how you can train children from quite a young age around neurodiversity and what neurodiversity means. We also know that if you actually just explain to children that a child is autistic and what it is that makes them different, children get their head around that probably more quickly than adults do. Um, they have, they're very, intuitively accepting towards difference and cognitively they're much more flexible than adults as adults we tend to be we tend to be less flexible and we find change harder but actually children children get their head around it very very quickly so actually that's a very good strategy and one which we know is effective great thank you james thank you catherine and over to carl yeah hi uh, i'm carl greetings from germany Thanks a lot for inviting me. So uh, we have a son or son, 27 years old, is autistic. And so we have a lot of experience and what we have seen so far, the older, the worse. So uh, elder people with autistic, it's extremely difficult. So uh, even with 27 years, our son is uh, an older autist. He's not in, a, in the age of, people at, at school and so what we see so we know a lot a lot a lot of autistic people and what we see 90 percent of those people never ever get anything wrong and they even do not uh, accept any support so it's very very uh, difficult to get support for them not because the support is not there so our son was uh, diagnosed when he was uh, 17 years old so um, quite quite normal not too early not too late and uh, but what we've seen in the uh, last 10 or 15 years is uh, that he does not accept help and uh, there are a lot of other autistic people that we know they are in the same situation so my big question is how to help those autistic people that do not really accept support they live between taking medication and having the side effects and uh, refusing medication being aggressive and then so um with our son it took a very very bad end so he stitched his mother with uh, 17 stitches and now he is in in what we call forensic it's a combination of a uh, hospital and prison so it's very very dramatic and uh and we have a lot of other people in um uh, in in not so severe situation but very very challenging living conditions in gh between something like uh 25 and 55 it's, it's extremely difficult so we we also know some very 
low percentage of people who really do very, very well in life, but it's a small percentage, let me say, around uh, 2% of the autistic uh, people. And th that's the uh, the group of autistic people where always is, is written about and where you always speak about. But what is with these 90% uh, of autistic people and how to help them? I think, I think for me, the, the first thing is to reflect the diversity of the spectrum and 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 to make sure that we're not sort of thinking about providing support as if autism is just one thing and making sure that we understand different people's strengths and needs B being in a position where people feel able to accept support as well and feel that it's not stigmatizing as well and and, and something which um which they shouldn't they shouldn't feel worried about um, and then also trying to understand and um, you know how to help people who are less motivated. I certainly know that the, the kids that I grew up with, the children that I grew up alongside, some of them were like me, they were very motivated to, 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 to learn and other people are less motivated. And, <laughs> and um, we need to find ways of working with different types of people. And I think it's about almost the neurodiversity within the autism spectrum making sure that we're that we're, we're reflecting that and i think we can only get better at that over time as we build a better understanding of autism uh thank you james and thank you carl carl if, if please allow me as well to add to this answer um, i think one of the most important things for us is the early diagnosis as well as early as we diagnose autism i think uh, the more probability we have chances to improve and to support. But on the other side, definitely, Carl, you have a huge experience and you have all my support for the effort and the work that you have been putting together with your partner uh, all over this years. But still, we should work as a community. We should try to support each other because as James mentioned, and I echo him strongly, that every single human being, whether autistic or not, is a different case. Yeah. He has Absolutely. a different way of being motivated. Yeah. And the human beings are very challenging and uh, they are really, really unique creations. Yeah. The issue is how can we support each other and work together to find this way of motivating the person to make a difference. This is where we are lagging behind. Yeah. If we manage to do this, then a family like yours would find the right help from the community to bring this into a better situation. And then we have one more person that is contributing to the community. This is, this is where the challenge is. And I hope we're building this ecosystem. I hope that we reach to the level where we really create this kind of harmony, this kind of learning from each other, where we can support each other. But Carl, my, my, my recognition and, 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 and what to say, my recognition and support to you and to your partner for all this effort that you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mercedes, over to you. You have another question. Yeah, I think uh, the key is educating parents, teachers, and all the people around these uh, kids, because uh, especially those who are living in the third world country, of course, they cannot afford the OT, the eBay, the RBT. So educating them, since social media is now anywhere. So I think uh, since James is, uh, I think, uh, into this, maybe he, he can just... Uh, be a, how do you call it the, uh, an advocate to the parents or uh you know. yeah okay i like ideas and i always take ideas to the next level james how about if every day you could record a 10 seconds 30 seconds tip <laughs> very short one and share it with us and we will post this on social media exactly 
Yeah, well, I'm very happy to share the work that we're doing, the content content that we're doing. I'm very reluctant to um, add to my quite long um, quite long to do list, but I'm very keen, uh, very happy to share. Think about how we can sh share some of the spots. Think, in think, think about something easy. Yeah, something yeah. Something does not take much time from you. A yeah. tip on a thirty seconds message that you could share it with people. And the tip that you might think that is not helpful could be the the the, the biggest hope of a family. Ja selbst, Sie haben mir auch keine Vorschläge, weil die Hilfe nicht annimmt. Ich habe alles gesagt, gehen Ihnen Hilfe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, allow me to share one of the feedbacks. Man kann, verbessern, kann versuchen, die Menschen uh, besser zu verstehen, aber dann... Ja. Karl, would you mind um, um, muting? Uh, but this is something that we could work on, and I think um, Haley could help us on doing something together mm -hmm. with Catherine. But uh, before I go to the next comment from Lena, uh, who uh, um, comes to share with me the last family name. Uh, I want to share a message from one of our participants, Chris, Chris Watney. And Chris wrote saying, great presentation, James. I love the focus on the benefits that can accrue to employers that positively embrace a more inclusive workplace. Everything you are doing to break down prejudice and promote understanding is very valuable. All power to you. Uh, we thank as well Chris for this nice comment and over to Lena before we hand again to Mercedes. Mercedes, you've been one of our most active participants today. Uh, first of all, let me greet everyone and thank you for, for such a, a wonderful meeting. Um, first, uh, my name is Lena and I have a, a child four years old diagnosed for autis autism. Um, I've seen the signs earlier, but uh, it was confirmed when he was two years old. Definitely, uh, yani, I understand the, the, the pain that uh, lots of families are having or the stress that much of the families are facing. So I can understand what M Mr. Carl and, and, and his partner are facing and his child as well. Um, I will talk about part of, uh, according to my point of view, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's according to my very little experience with my child. It's how to find the root cause of the something. Yeah, for example, if the child is having a, a, a stressful attitude or he's trying to repeat a word or he's uh, uh, moving in circles around, definitely there is a root cause. And I'm talking here like a safety profession. But if you discover what is the root cause, you, you can manage to communicate and help the problem. So this is, this is part of how I'm doing it with, with my child. Yeah, and when he's uh, hyper, I can try to, to, to reach why he's hyper. If he's uh, uh, repeating the words, there's something that is triggering this. Maybe it's uh, um, an attitude, maybe it's something. But this is, this is just to, to share my little experience about it. The most thing that I'm suffering nowadays is how to let him tell me that somebody did hurt him. For example, a child bite him. How, how he can explain this? How can he say it? How he can say, somebody hit me somebody uh, bruised me uh, i'm feeling pain this way and we started this we reached this with him that he's telling me uh, uh, i feel pain this part it's it's painful for me but we we, we are progressing with it and I, I really appreciate um the work has been done and the researches are done because they are very helpful one of the main um, things that i've also discovered with my child is that repetition is very important it's like training them for the for for whatever you want them to do Training is very important. Repeating the, the, the actions for them daily, for example, the routine that you have to keep with. This is very important because they can cover, they can cope with it. But this is need to, a lot of uh, patience from the parents. And we need to have our, uh, as an example, soft areas to, to, to de-stress de our, our feelings and our attitudes. But uh, for all of the people are here or having an autism at the family or, or, or a son or a child or a neighbor, well, you, you are part of the community that doing a great job. It's very stressful. Yes, but we have to, to be up to it because it's, it's not an easy challenge. It's a, a, a high hope challenge. And we, are, we have to be positive that we will reach something good. Why not? Thank you. 
together we can. Thank you, Lena. And over to you, James, if you have any comments. No, just to say those are great comments and thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I also want to say thank you to um, and so everyone else who's um, shared their experience with Carl and and, um, and Haley and Mercedes as well. And you know, you know, it's always really it's 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 it's, it's never nice to, to, to hear about some of the, the challenges that people and experiences that people are, are facing. You know, in, in certain moments. But I really hope that the work that we're all doing will begin to contribute to delivering change in the future and ensuring that we're, we're moving towards a, a place where we understand more of um in a, in a, in a better way what works for, for different types of autistic people thank you thank you very much james uh, mercedes please uh in addition to that uh, uh question is it Lynn? what's the name i forgot uh if if the child is non-verbal I don't know if her child is non-verbal, then he can use uh, cue cards. Because if he cannot express himself that he's bitten by someone, then he must be uh, a card, he must be having a card and then like a, what do you call it, an ID and put it on her, on his neck and then just show I was like this. If he needs something and then he can just, show the card to the to the person or to the adult attending and uh, the other thing is uh, <clears throat> what is it uh, uh what triggers uh, his his behavior or her behavior you have to find out the antecedent what happens why he or she is acting like that prior because you have to know what triggers the behavior so it's really important to know, you know, that the, the uh, what do you call it, activities or the scenario. So if you know that, then at least you can do some prompts or some interventions. And uh, I'll address this to James. Um, uh, James, you said autism is a lifelong. Uh, neurological condition, right? So there's no cure. Now, uh, since you're very active and you, you are doing such a good job being an autism, how do you maintain or understanding uh, to have a relationship with other people? Because I think there's a deficit in, in uh, social interaction so how are you coping up with that? Do you still have the, the therapy or intervention or you're just trying to be, uh, what do you call that? Uh, dealing with yourself, being accepted by the society? Well, I mean, I think, I think every person and family deals with it differently and it depends greatly on the, the hand that you're dealt. You know, from from my own personal perspective, um, I I I find it very useful to to learn from other people, to learn understand how different people communicate. Except that the way that I communicate will at times be slightly different from how other people communicate. So have realistic expectations around yourself and understand that uh, you know and have the humility to know that you won't always get everything right. <laughs> You'll make mistakes, and like everyone. That you make mistakes, and that like everyone, you have strengths and 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 and, and challenges and difficulties and weaknesses. And you know, I think that level of self awareness the diagnosis gives you is 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 difficult. It's difficult coming to terms and accepting that you might have certain challenges in certain areas. But also, it's a gift in some ways because it helps you to understand yourself. And you know, one of the things I often say is that you know, there's many people who. Um, who aren't autistic, who would really benefit from knowing what some of their strengths are, and some of their areas for development or difficulties are. And so actually being able to understand that from early age and develop strategies has been very, very helpful. Doesn't mean to say that there aren't days where things are difficult, but I've got, you know, 
a number of people around me, you know, from the team here at Autistica, through to people at home and friends and, and so on who are, who are very, very supportive. And so I'm in a very privileged and lucky position. And I think that's a, the other thing I'd really emphasize about my own experience is that, you know, if things were slightly different for me, if I didn't get the right skilling, if I um, didn't have the set of experiences that I have, my outcome could have been extremely different. And, you know, I feel very fortunate and very privileged. And, you know, you know, my story is not about saying, look what I can do, can everyone else do it? You know, everyone else can be the same. I, everyone has a very different experience, different set of needs, and has, and maybe hasn't, you know, had the same access to support that I've had. So I, I realize that I'm, I'm very lucky in several ways. Full, full, full respect to the parents. So that's, that's what I could say. Yani, I wish we could have the chance to invite them. But uh, the, the, the important piece here is, it is if we put two autistic children who has the same condition exactly, one of them got the proper support and one of them did not get the proper support and treatment, we will end up with completely opposite outcomes. It's, it's the, the, the key to this, what James mentioned in the beginning when he said, right support, proper support plan. This is what we need to work together on. Carl, I think you have one more comment. Yes, sure. Um, Osama, you mentioned that uh, the right uh, treatment, the right support is essential in order to, uh, to, to, to foster the situation of autists. I agree that this is uh, this is uh, very very important. No question about it. But uh, in the case of our son, he always had the best possible support, the best therapists, the best doctors, the best psychologists, all all the best. But what we experienced was uh, it got worse when the uh, puberty, when the adolescence come, and uh, because um, autism is a problem of the interaction with other people, it, um, it um, came to the situation that our son was not able to get access to girls. So a pretty normal sexual development of, of, of this person was impossible. And this is what worsened the situation a lot because, uh, because uh, Mercedes, you told us um, what is 100% true, that we have to look what were the situations that led to a situation that is worse than it was before? And in um, in case with our son, it was the adolescence, the poverty that came up, and from that point on, it it got worse and worse and worse. And we we observed this with a lot of other artists that this is a very very serious point, and it it is never ever discussed at any place so it's it's like a, a, a deep deep silence about this topic no i yeah I agree. please james yeah no just to say absolutely you know absolutely appreciate that it sounds like you've had an extremely challenging a challenging experience and um and you know i'm really keen that you know as part of what we do that we, you know, as, as much as there's a, there's 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 an awful lot of great things going on, and it sounds like your your son had the best support that we had available, uh, that was available at the time. That we that we hopefully learn to do things differently, and hopefully, you know, with more research and with more understanding around what works and what different people's needs are, and what how we can personalize that support. My hope is that you know that some of the difficulties that your that your son has experienced that we can. We can sort of find different ways of dealing with things and that we to hopefully ensure that he has a better life experience you know that someone like him you know has a better life experience in the future and has uh, has better support in place and that you know when people like your son do have the experience they have that we can put them in a position where they can hopefully be rehabilitated and and and, and put on the right and put on the right track but you know as i said at the beginning we are at the foothills it's a big mountain <laughs> That we have to climb, and uh, I'm 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 really sad to say that we we definitely don't have all of the answers yet. Thank you very much, James. Um, Thank you, James. Uh, Augustine, we have a quick question, and this will be our last question. 
So we stick to our time and the agenda. Okay, thank you, Sama. Um, James, thank you very much for sharing your personal experiences also. I, but I want to ask, how do you set barriers? Uh, because in all of this, the anxiety for me is central. And for me, the immediate thing we have to look at when it comes to the anxiety is the immediate environment of the person. So for instance, the parents, and the parents could be stressed to cause the anxiety because of stigma and also stigma on the person involved. And that can make the person more anxiety, anxious. So how do you set barriers? If he say that I don't like this, I mean, but you think that it's something that he needs or you have to support with. So Carl, you are right. Uh, but probably maybe um, your son would have been in a worse situation, but for the supportive environment that you've given. So thank you and continue to, to support in the best way that you can. Yeah, so, so um, you know, well, I think the good thing about anxiety and autism is that as much as we know it's a huge issue, our understanding of this is building all of the time. So we understand a lot more about anxiety and autism now than we did 10 years ago. It's actually been one of the areas where we've made an awful lot of progress. So we know that uncertainty is a huge issue that contributes to anxiety in autistic people. We know that sensory prop issues are in sensory environments are a big problem. We know that autistic people are more likely to be bullied and experience a range of issues around the stigma that cause um, that cause problems. And so we, we are now building up a set of strategies and interventions and approaches that we know that can help to um, support uh, autistic people who experience anxiety. And from, a, and from a personal perspective, I think it's, important, it's an important balance to strike and it's something that I think all humans um, struggle with. But my view is that you, you know, it is important to challenge yourself and push yourself to do things and give yourself opportunities and not deny yourself of opportunities, but you need to make sure that you're doing that in a way that's that's a challenging and is the right level for you and isn't overwhelming. You know, I think it's about making sure that you're balancing that in an appropriate way, that you're putting yourself in a position where you're giving yourself the chance to grow and to succeed in life and, and, to, and, to, and to challenge yourself in life, but you don't put yourself in a position, hopefully that's overwhelming. I think that's a particularly challenging balance to strike if you're autistic. Thank you very much, James. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today and attending the webinar. It was uh, very interactive. I personally learned a lot of things. And as we have taken a commitment in ourselves in HHERF that we always want to make sure that we move the talk into a walk, I think the outcome of today's conversation is, James, you're going to be the star. Every day we need a message from you. Whatever easy, whatever convenient, we'll work together with you and the team to find the appropriate thing. And uh, hopefully this could be uh, something that helped people across the globe and could take the message of Otestica from only just working and localized in UK to the global level internationally where people could uh, learn and understand better about autism. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much for being with us and thanks a lot for Utestica and the support that they have been doing and extending to the people over the previous decades. Thanks, thanks everybody everyone. and have a beautiful day. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you, Osama. Thank you, James. Thank you, Carl. Thank thanks you. for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi bye -bye. to Maria, Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.